here are the world uh, creators summit and i'm here with uh, michael simon the ceo of uh, hfa or the harry fox agency so hi michael and great to have you on thank you for having me so first of all let's talk about uh, you know the hfa uh, with a uh, 46000 publishing partners and a growing number of deals with digital music services uh, you know you've done deals uh, with uh, lyric fine music match amazon uh, crickets move and, and many more uh, helping facilitate uh, the mechanicals for for those for those uh, uh, companies and so first of all uh, you know this is the first feature that we're doing the company, so I wanted to just make sure that uh, the people that are listening know what, what, what you guys do. And so can you just briefly give an overview of the HF, what, what the HFA's mission is? So the Harry Fox Agency has been in business since the 1920s, principally in the United States. Its original core mission was to represent the interests of music publishers with respect to mechanical reproduction. So we are not a public performance organization. We are not ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. We represent, we were historically representing publishers as they engaged in licensing activities with those who used their works. Now, that's a, in the modern world, there are hundreds of thousands of people who use it. In the old days of two years ago, that meant record companies, principally standing between publishers and record companies for mechanical licensing, then collection of the royalties, distribution of the royalties, and then confirming compliance with the terms of the licenses. That's the old line historical business. That business continues. It is a good, solid core business, but we all know we're, we are speaking now, literally this second, through digital technology, the introduction of digital technology to the music marketplace shattered the marketplace, made it a much more fragmented and frankly more interesting marketplace than the, than the monolithic marketplace that it used to be. But with, with fragmentation and interest comes confusion and challenge. So the HFA mission has grown to include providing services to those engaged in the distribution or aggregation of music, whether it's licensing services, royalty management services, data services, distribution, or market engagement services like trying to find rights holders. So when you put that all together, HFA still does what you described, which is represent the interests of more than 45,000 publishers and is also helping those who distribute music obtain the rights that they need and then administer the rights that they've obtained. Yeah. And the HFA has got uh, what's perhaps the most comprehensive database in the world right now for uh, uh, understanding, uh, at least from, from a US standpoint, who owns what uh, uh, on, on the publishing front for tracks. And so, when the, and of course, this is something that you have amassed over, over the years uh, of, uh, of doing uh, deals. Uh, and, and I wanted to understand when did you realize how valuable that information was uh, because it, it's really not available anywhere else. Yeah. The, the aggregation of publishing information has probably always been va valuable relative to the market, which means in 1930 that that index, the, the, the file cabinet of index cards was valuable to the record companies who could go to a single place and ask who owns a song and then obtain a license. So in that market it was very valuable. In the modern market, that file cabinet would not be very valuable. What is valuable is the several million musical works in our database that are not standalone data fields. They're tied into the master recordings, which means if someone tells us an artist name and a song title and they don't know the publishing, we can still find it, which that is where extreme value lies, meaning in, the, in, in this world, although it would be nice if everyone who uses a song knows who the publisher and the writer is, they don't. Some do, most don't. But they do know the name of the band, they know the name of the song, more or less, maybe they know the record company. If you give me that information, most of the time, I can tie that into the publisher and the writer and ensure that a right can be granted. So, as, as the music marketplace became infused with various forms of digital distribution. The value of our data aggregation, just like it was in the 30s, it rolled forward to become equally valuable in the modern marketplace. So probably when specifically, around 2000, as digital services, 2000, 2001, as digital services started to try to make their way in the world, the ability to build out that database became market appropriate valuable. I remember, you know, you have uh, a lot of uh, publishers that are associated with the HFA, and so uh, when you do a, a deal with a new uh, technology company, uh, how hard is it uh, to explain 
to them and to make sure that they understand what the proposition is and that they they, they realize what the all, all the terms of the license are because of course every, every company has got a different uh, slightly different business model and a slightly different proposition for you right it's okay. the answer to that is <laughs> the short answer is it's difficult but there's a longer answer there it was it was difficult in 2002 because the rights were not certain people didn't know what a stream was, let alone is there a mechanical reproduction in a stream. We have begun to establish the rights profile and the rates associated with those rights and build out the infrastructure, which means that there are those who struggle to understand it, those who've been in the business for a decade who are starting to understand it, and frankly, we're moving to a world where you don't need to understand it as well to be in the business. If you bought an automobile in 1910, you needed to know how to repair it, and you needed to have the tools, you needed to know how an internal combustion engine worked. If you buy an automobile now, if someone hands you a key, that might be all you need to know. You probably haven't opened the hood, unless you collect cars, you probably haven't opened the hood of a car in the last five years. And if you did, you wouldn't recognize what's in there and you don't need to know that. But in the 1920s, you did. In the digital music space, 10 years ago, you needed to understand, I can say a phrase, no one will under, you needed to understand a tethered download buffer copy on demand stream, mechanical reproduction, it was, a lot of words that meant causing music to go from A to B. Yeah. Nowadays, although we can explain it at any level, there are companies that come in and understand it, companies that come in don't understand it and don't want to, and companies who want to in order to know what they don't ever want to know again. But four or five years ago, the greater challenge is if you have companies entering the US marketplace who are not US-centered companies, then you have another layer of complexity because you're dealing with someone who is used to a society world yep. where a mechanical reproduction society has exclusive rights and all rights and, and operates by providing to you an invoice based on you providing usage. In the United States, although we have a large market at HFA, we are not an exclusive agency and we are not a rights holder. And there are folks, publishers, who license direct and we license under a statute and you and it's a self-assessing statute so european distributors entering the u.s market and unless they have a good advisor a lot of experience the u.s of course thinks that the whole world understands the u.s when in fact the u.s process stands alone in the world and so that creates an interesting experience when i or someone on my team speaks with the lawyers or business executives of a European company entering the U.S. market. That's a longer conversation. Yeah, sure. And uh, the HFA, of oh, course, has is, is, is been uh, historically uh, based around U.S. data. Do, do you feel like you, you uh, ever want to branch out into more international uh, repertoire? Yes. Not, not to grant a reproduction right in a non-U.S. territory, but there is, there is repertoire that originates. Uh, there's a, a great song in France, and someone records it in France. That master recording will find its way into a U.S. service. We need to be able to identify that. That re musical work will be recorded by a band in the United States. Probably a very hip band if they're listening to that stuff. And we will need to be able to identify it and trace it back to its originating society, who will then trace it back to its originating publisher, who will trace it back to the writers. So we are not looking at granting rights in non-US territories. But we are always interested in the data about musical works. We have built out our database to include repertoire from Hong Kong. Yeah. We are bringing in, we bring in repertoire from the, from the societies around the world. And we're continuing to do that. Sure. And looking at the, the World, World uh, Creators Summit and, and all the conversations that are being had here, uh, how do you feel about uh, the state of the conversations, uh, uh, both between you know, the technology sector and the, and the creators and also uh, amongst creators in, in different sectors themselves? The, the conversation is, it, it continues to be an interesting conversation, and I don't say that lightly, meaning it's not as if we've run out <laughs> of topics to talk about. There are, there are those who are strident in their point of view on either side. There are those who are developing new businesses and facing honest to goodness, first impression issues. So some amount of the discussion is very partisan based on the perspective of the, the interest group of the speaker. But there is, there is also, we are looking at in the United States a possible revision of the Copyright Act 
There was a new one in 1909. There was a new one in 1976. That's a pretty wide gulf. Yeah. 76 to 2013, much tighter. And there's a world that believes on, and it's not just pro or anti-copyright people. There are people in every group who believe that the Copyright Act is not tuned to the current market, which means you bring together officials from the U.S. government, elected officials or appointed officials and their staff and all the interest groups, rights holders, those who rely upon rights, that's going to be an interesting conversation. And it's, it's not, it, 10 years ago when events like this occurred, conversation was strident, but people didn't even fully understand what they were talking about. Not because they were ignorant, but because it was brand new. Yeah. We are much better informed, which means we still have disagreement, we still have robust debate, but it's informed based on evolutions in the law and business practice, which to me means the conversation has been actually really interesting. Yeah. Listening to people like, wow, that's... <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if, if a few years ago you were probably coming to a conference like this and hearing a lot of uh, sweeping generalizations on, on the state of industry, now people are actually going into the nitty-gritty of actually exactly what's happening, and, and that's quite interesting. Well, the other thing that's happened is... It, Five, ten years ago, a lot of what people were talking about, was, a lot of it was about the future yep. and the infrastructure, the rights infrastructure that would need to exist for a business that doesn't exist yet. So we talked about what would a rate be for a stream and what would a streaming business really look like? And if, and if it was launched and licensed, would the consumers come? We now have... We had our first rates for streaming in 2008. So we now have multiple, we have five years of operations for streaming services, for free to consumer on demand streaming services, for ad supported streaming services, for limited download companies. In the olden days of seven years ago, we had ideas but no actual businesses. We now have executives showing up who have budgets and P&Ls and results. And we can talk about the impact of the rights, the rates, and the implementation of that on actual businesses, which means we're now not having an intellectual conversation about the future. We're talking about real businesses really operating in the market. So that changes the conversation. And so uh, just to, to finish, I wanted to ask you about uh, the direction of the HFA. You know, what do you think are the most promising uh, avenues for the company in, in the next uh, year or two? HFA will continue to develop not only its services for publishers, but of increasing importance, its services for distributors. We are beginning to see a market form for, for the services that we're offering to distributors. And in that market, there's, there's, an, there's a, an immediate and urgent need for those companies to be able to focus on their business and not focus aggressively on the rights management piece of the business. That no one got into the business of music distribution because they could build the best royalties database or the best publishing database. They got into the business because they believed that they uniquely could cause people to want to listen to music and enjoy it. If they're distracted from that mission, then we won't see the new mu music marketplace develop. So it behooves HFA to continue to develop the services that will allow those kinds of businesses to launch. So our future is to continue to build out the service offering that allows new businesses to launch, new businesses to flourish. There's a very tactical answer about techn technologically speaking what we need to do to do that. We've got those plans in place and we're building, we're actually building out that business and this business will continue to grow in that new direction. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.